Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Created and hosted by me, writer and broadcaster, Sam Baker. Today's guest has a talent for tapping into what people are thinking, not to mention an enviable bullshit radar. Since we first met almost 15 years ago, Sally Hughes has become a leading journalist and presenter. Her beauty column for The Guardian is responsible for the contents of a million or more makeup bags, and she's just turned her YouTube series, In the Bathroom With, into a podcast, Beyond the Bathroom. In 2018, she co-founded the award-winning charity Beauty Banks, providing essential toiletries to people living in poverty. Arguably, we have never needed that charity more than we do right now. Sally's new book, Everything is Washable, is what you'd get if Nora Ephron took on Mrs. Beaton, an empathetic, no-nonsense guide to navigating almost everything modern life has to throw at us. I think most people do want some kind of order in their lives. They don't want to feel like a hot mess. They don't want to feel like everything's chaotic. I grew up like that, and it's actually really not fun remotely. Sally joined me to discuss how being homeless in her teens created her obsession with home, the power of making women feel can do, and why you should never ever relinquish your bank account. We also talked learning to parent when you haven't been parented and healthcare privilege. Plus, she had plenty to say about the way brands misrepresent perimenopausal women. Let's start by talking about the book then. You've had this idea has been kicking around, hasn't it, for a while in your head, this update of Mrs. Beaton? Yes. I mean, I needed to know what the next book I was writing was. And so um, unrelated to that, I just happened to order Mrs. Beaton from Amazon one day because I realized I'd never actually read it. And it's such an iconic book. So I ordered it not with any plans for it. And it came and I don't know if you've ever seen a copy, but it's absolutely enormous. It looks like the yellow pages and the text within is like something from a Bible. It's so, so, so tiny kind of biblical print. And it was impenetrable. It was completely, I just couldn't get anywhere with it. It's so hard to read. And I thought, oh, well, I wonder what would be in a modern version. Mrs. Beaton had so little to do with my life, quite rightly, because it was very Mm. of its time. And I thought, I wonder what you would put in a book like that now. And that got me thinking about different things you know what do you actually need to know how to do and so I opened a Facebook group and just said what do you want to know how to do and I thought right well if I know them I'll put them in the book and then alongside that I um, combined it with questions I got on DM on Instagram which were usually how did you make what you're eating or where did you get those genes or whatever it is and I kind of put those together as well and shoved it all in a book. So what made you buy Mrs. Beaton in the first place? Because was it like a sense that you just didn't know how to do stuff? Because I definitely feel like that. I feel like domestically incompetent. No, it wasn't that at all. I I feel like I'm quite competent in that way. I bought it because it's such an iconic book that everybody in the world knows about. But I have a natural curiosity about things like that, where I think, but has anyone actually read it recently? And I had never read it at all. No. And I just thought, I wonder what's actually in it. And I had no idea. I thought it would be like this quaint sort of um, hardback, like beautiful book that I could kind of feel cosy and pour over. But actually, when it came, it's really hard work. It's just not fun to read. And I thought, well, I'd like it to be more fun. I'd like it, obviously, to be more modern and relevant. And that's what inspired me. But I definitely didn't buy it for that research purpose. I bought it because I've just always been curious, I think. I've quite often not read the iconic books and every now and then I think oh I really should read that and then I get them yeah it's kind of one of those things that maybe your nan had I don't know I'm trying to remember if my mum had one can't remember we had and I bet you had this because I think our generation of mums had the Hamlin all colour cookbook remember with all the things floating in aspic yeah it was all things Uh, floating in aspic and there were lots of like sponge fingers around everything that's what we had we didn't have Mrs Beaton because Mrs Beaton's properly old like it's got really really old things in it whereas things like Delia Smith and Hamlin you can look back and go that's really bloody useful whereas Mrs Beaton is completely a different time and so um I thought god like the entire world has changed for women since this book was written so I was quite kind of interested in that but then everything had to go through a kind of filtration system so I decided what was going to go in the book based on what I actually knew so the question I had to ask myself with everything is why me 
why not YouTube? And if I would have to look it up on YouTube, then I felt it shouldn't be in the book because what's the point in hearing my perspective on it? So I still don't know how to change a tyre and changing a tyre is not in the book because I don't know how to do it. And I feel like what's the point in me writing about that when you can just look up a video and watch it? Yeah, that's the thing is I suppose you could say that YouTube's replaced Mrs. Beaton in a way, but maybe for our generation, it hasn't quite. Yeah, and I think I think people still love reading and they still like a voice and you can't cozy up can you in the same way and I think really it was about it was partly about best practice but it wasn't so much about the right or wrong way to do things it was just this is my perspective and insight and experience and this is why I do things a certain way I didn't want anyone to think it was kind of super prescriptive and what's been quite lovely is um, a woman came to a book launch people have been giving me their tips and I was doing an event in London and an Australian woman came up to me and she said I've read the whole book I absolutely love it but I really disagree with the jet lag solutions here's what I do and so I got out a piece of paper and I wrote down what she does for jet lag because she's constantly back and forth and I, I wanted it to be more of a conversation than a kind of you must do things this way and it's been really really nice to hear the way women other women do things. Yeah one of the things I really liked about it is it's kind of it's got a kind of a old school feel obviously a contemporary take on old school feel but that old school kind of sharing of advice which now we do and it's very much more like emotional and I really liked that sense of you know the nemesis how to fold a fitted sheet I mean still can't do it I've tried following your advice but I still can't do it yeah quite a few women have said to me oh I felt quite can do after reading it they read it and suddenly decided they were going to blitz their box room or they were going to blitz the attic or clear out their wardrobe or they were going to batch cook for a couple of weeks and I like the idea of people reading it and thinking I can do that because I'm I'm quite a sort of um can do sort of a person and I and I hope I hope that people get that from it and do you know what even if you do nothing from the book it doesn't really matter if you enjoy sitting and reading it that's enough it's like I cook a lot and yet I hardly ever cook from recipes. But what I do do is sit and read recipes for comfort. And I think whatever mm-hmm. your relationship with books is, whether you are looking for instruction from books or just comfort and entertainment, that it's completely fine. I understand both. And very often I don't look to books to tell me how to do things, but um, I enjoy books that tell you how to do things just for reading pleasure. So hopefully there's, there's something for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I always think that about recipe books because I I was going to say I can't cook, but don't cook might be a better way of putting it. But I love reading recipe books. I love that kind of journey yeah. that they take you on. Yeah, and they're always written. I always think that like food but you know, partly why people like Nigel Slater and Nigella Lawson and Diana Henry or whatever are so brilliant is not only that they're brilliant cooks, which obviously they are, and it's not only that their recipes are brilliant, which they obviously are. It's that they're so they write about food with such love and such affection and meaning that it that it takes you somewhere. It doesn't matter if you never cook the recipe. So Nigella, for example, I I hate baking. I'm just not a baker. I'm a good cook, but I'm a really not very good baker. I'm just not interested in it. It's too mathsy for me. But I will read a Nigella baking book and just get so much from it, even though I'm literally never going to get up and make the cake because I don't find making cakes fun at all. And so hopefully it has that sense of, well, I don't have to do this, but the way she's talking about it is giving me some entertainment about this book. In the intro to the home section, you tell a really moving story about your dad and about going back to the home you left can you tell us a bit about that so I was at the uh hay literary festival about I can't remember when it was now maybe 10 years ago and um I just started dating my now husband and he came it was it was the first thing we'd gone away and done together it was like the first weekend away I was staying with some friends in Hay some other writers and he came and stayed with us and then we had a spare day and we decided to get in my car and go around where I came from where I come from which is about 45 50 minutes away from Hay so we got in the car we went to my primary school we went to the library where I used to skive off from school and hide we went to my grandparents house where I was born like just did all the stuff then we went to the house that um, I had 
grown up in my first home. And um, it's my parents had lived there together, but my mother had left there when I was a baby. And we had stayed with my dad behind in this house. So we stood outside the house, my husband and I, my then boyfriend and I, and we kind of peered in as respectfully as we could from the other side of the road. And this really, really lovely, lovely couple, an older couple came out and said, oh, can we help you? And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I grew up here. I was just showing my boyfriend. And they, in typical South Wales, fashion said come on in have a cup of tea so we went in and we had a cup of tea and they were the nicest warmest sweetest kindest people and they showed us around the house it's tiny house little end of terrace house and they showed us around the house and they had looked after it and it was so lovely there was like potpourri and accent towels and nice cushions and they'd raise their kids there and their grandchildren were around all the time everybody went to them for Christmas and everything and um, as they were showing us around they said, oh, we're so glad you're seeing it now and not when we bought it, because we bought it after your family had left. Another man bought it. And when he um, when he left, the house was in a terrible, terrible state. We're so glad you didn't see it then. You'd have been heartbroken. There was vermin and there was rubbish everywhere. And there were piles and piles of rubbish and scrap in the garden. And it was dirty and there was no central heating. The plumbing didn't work. And her and her husband listed off all this terrible stuff about the house and how pleased they were that I hadn't seen it in such a state and how happy they were to have brought it back to health and then um, I I just felt so embarrassed and so ashamed because they were describing my house and the man they bought it from. The man they said, oh, he developed a drink problem. He'd got divorced and explaining this man to me. And that was my dad. There was nothing they were telling me that was news to me. I'd lived in that house in exactly the way they described it. And I I didn't say to my husband at the time, I think I told him maybe a couple of months later, I told my brothers about it. We'd all discussed it, but I didn't tell my boyfriend because I was just kind of so embarrassed. And I started the chapter like that because I felt like I had to explain why I was so obsessed with home and why home meant so, so, so much to me. And I've been asked quite a few times to write a memoir and I've always said, there's absolutely no way I'm writing a memoir. But I felt like this book needed some memoir aspects to it to justify Mm -hmm. or to explain why I was approaching a subject in the way that I was. Now your parents are both dead. Are you not tempted to reconsider the memoir issue? No, no. No, no, I won't because... First of all, I've got four brothers and I sort of feel like it's Mm. our story. But it's not just my story to tell. It's all of our story. And as I'm the only professional writer and I sort of feel that I would have to be really careful about how I told their stories. And then that doesn't feel particularly true. So there's all of that. And then also I just wouldn't um, I couldn't bear to inflict Internet trolls on my family. You see, I just couldn't bear Mm. for my brother's. Uh, to have to deal with people picking over things that are very painful and personal to all of us. Um, I just wouldn't be able to do that to them. I wouldn't be able to do it to myself, but I definitely wouldn't be able to do it to them. And so I feel like the internet has kind of forced my hand, really. What might have once been a possibility is now an impossibility because I just couldn't I just couldn't throw my family to the wolves like that. It's like the internet has really given with one hand and taken away with the other, hasn't it, in terms of, well, many people's careers, but in terms of your career I mean yeah yeah I mean well everyone's life really it's just a completely uh, different world now and uh, you know there's no putting the genie back in the bottle and you just kind of have to you just have to kind of cope with it and live with it as best you can and try and be grateful for the good stuff but yeah yeah, I mean it's really 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 difficult I do know how I feel about it but it's it's imbalanced in all sorts of ways I can I can absolutely see the good and I owe it a lot but I also don't see why I should have to accept some aspects of it I think people who are unkind dishonest and nasty on the internet will always use the justification of well you know Mm. you do all right you do all right out of this world so you have to expect it and I don't think that anybody should have to expect stories being made up about them really I don't think that I don't think that's a reasonable expectation of anybody and their families no of course you know of course there's great stuff about it we could start listing all the great things about the internet and literally never stop and it's you know and things happening day by day but um it's taken me a long time to find a relationship with the internet that I can live with in relative peace and it's a work in progress but I I definitely feel fairly detached from it in a way that I didn't used to 
it's easy to forget that some people are people, people with profile, but the internet has made that more possible in a way. It's made it easy to forget the humanity of the people that your one is attacking. I mean, I think what you've just said can be applied to me, but can be applied to basically everything, right? I mean, yeah. so whenever I see people arguing on the internet, I think, right, neither of you can see facial expression, neither of you can hear tone of voice, and neither of you is seeing a human being, you're seeing an avatar. And I think 99 times out of 100, if you put two people face to face, they will find a common ground. And they will recognize in one another a humanity, a commonality, or, you know, something between them that will make a conversation possible and make a nuance possible. And on the internet, it's just not possible because all of the little visual cues we get from people or just the warmth between two people is gone. And you just have people screaming at some words. And I think that's dangerous for everybody. Um, And it's so, so, so easy to forget that, you're talking about a person. The only people I'm ever critical of now on the internet are elected officials, like government. Apart from that, and even then I wouldn't get personal about them, but but apart from that, I just think literally nobody in the world cares about your negative opinion of, of somebody except the person themselves. And so that's not worth it, is it? And so I, I, I think by and large, the internet in terms of interpersonal skills is bad. And I think people when they're face to face are better people than when they're not. Yeah, I think that's, that's so true. You've basically had to build your own home. I mean, everybody creates their home from scratch, but you have specifically had to build your own home from scratch. I mean, you left home, was it your mum's or your dad's home at 14, 15? So my mum's home so we all moved in with her when I was about eight coming up to 15 almost 15 I left then and came to London. So how did it feel when your eldest son passed the age when you left home how did that feel? My eldest son is now a few years older than I was when I left. God how old is he? And it's something he's nearly 18. Bloody hell. He's going to be 18 in the early spring. And this is something we laugh about because I sometimes cannot believe the questions he asks me, which I have to check myself and remind myself that the questions he's asking me are really normal questions for a 17-year-old to ask. But because they're questions that I had had to work out the answer to when I was 14, I'm sort of quite taken aback by them, you know, like, you know, how to pay for certain things, how to go about finding things, buying things. We laugh about it because I'm like, well, how? do you not know how to do that and it's like oh because you're 17 and that's normal he sometimes can't do things and I have to um and I have to remind myself that actually most 17 year olds can't do things and it wasn't normal to be living in a flat in Paddington at that point um and going to nightclubs all the time and uh and working and 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 doing anything to make ends meet that that's not actually normal and it's fine that it's actually great that he can never get stranded and not home because he's got an uber account with my card attached to it and things like that <laughs> <laughs> you know, that that's actually a really, really, really good thing, but not my experience at all. I mean, what you, your experience of being in your mid-teens is just, do you look back now and just think, do you know how you did it? Can you, because you were homeless on and off, weren't you? Or like sofa surfing homeless and... yeah. Yeah, there were two bouts of homelessness. Um, I sort of look back and in answer to your question, do I think, how did I do it? Yes and no. I know how I did it. And I think I did it in a way that sometimes only young people can. It's quite sad in that I sort of didn't care enough what happened to me in a way. Like I wasn't... I wasn't worried enough about myself in a way that I would be now or certainly that I would be about my own children. I was more gung-ho about putting myself on the line because I didn't really care about myself as much as I should have. So there was that. I also think kids feel fairly invincible in a way that is both good and bad. And also, I always felt throughout my life, and I've retained this definitely I always felt well you're literally just gonna die failure is not an option you're gonna die if you don't get somewhere here 
I was always really, really ambitious since I was a child. And so I never felt not getting through it was an option. I always knew that I had to be okay and that I had nobody to rely on. And I just had to make it work somehow. I was always really, 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 really determined. And I felt that I would get to be what I wanted to be because because the alternative was like, I just thought I would die if I didn't get um, to be where I wanted to be. It's quite hard to explain. and I, And I wouldn't... I wouldn't feel I wouldn't feel that way now. It's a combination of a lack of self-respect, a lack of self-care, and utter blind ambition and determination. And also I've always been a grafter. Mm. And lots of people work really, really hard and don't get anywhere. But I think I was able to identify good luck when I had it and really, really, really work hard when I identified the good luck, which lots of people are not fortunate enough to have. But I would meet people and think this is a stroke of luck that I've met them and I would really make the most of that and I was able to identify that because I it was just so important to me that I succeeded so I always felt that I would get somewhere because I wasn't prepared to entertain the possibility of the alternative. Presumably it made you incredibly financially responsible as well because you were like on your own from that age. Uh, no, it. <laughs> wasn't very, no, um, I wasn't very financially responsible. Actually, I was just skint, and um, you know, there's a difference. I didn't really have the opportunity to learn how to handle money because I never really had any. And it was only really when I started working proper that I had to think about money. That I just had to learn the hard way to be more responsible with it. When I was really, really, really broke, if you've only got sort of five pounds in the world, it doesn't really matter if you're responsible or irresponsible with it or basically just in a bad way um but when I started working I was never terrible I've never been terrible with money I've never been like really stupid with it or anything I've always paid my bills because my parents didn't pay their bills and we were always getting cut off and so I've you know I've always prioritized the stuff that absolutely has to be paid I always pay my taxes my bills and all of that stuff but Definitely came a cropper in, it was early 30s, so after I had my first son, I was so, so, so depressed with postnatal depression that um, I ran up loads of debt over the next few years. And then when I was getting divorced, I ran up loads of debt because I just didn't have any money and um, I had to pay for a really expensive divorce. But I haven't had any debt in a long time and I am pretty responsible. I'm not I'm not wasteful and I'm not stupid with it, but it was definitely a, a, a learned skill because I didn't have responsibly I didn't have financially responsible parents at all and um, I had financially chaotic parents for sure and then after I left home I was so skint that I didn't have the opportunity to manage money because I just didn't have any so it's something that I've had to learn along the way and something that I think lots of people uh, need to learn there are loads of uh, regrets I have around money the first somebody asked me the other day at a book event they said oh what would be the number one piece of financial advice you would give anyone and I just said no woman should ever, 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 regardless of the circumstances, surrender her own bank account. Do never do this. Never do this. Even if you're really happily married and you share a bank account for bills, do not ever end up in a situation where you personally don't have a bank account, which I did when I was married first time. I did surrender my own bank account and it's just mad. Don't ever do that. It's such a bad move. And so things like that, I've just kind of learned over the years for myself that I that I would consider cast iron rules now. Always have a running away fund, you know, always have mm. always have some money where if things go very badly wrong, you can cope for a little bit. You know, you, you can manage for a little bit if you have to flee a relationship or if somebody leaves you in the lurch, you know, you have to have a little bit of money to call your own. So things like that, yeah, I've had to learn the hard way for sure. It's interesting because so many of the women I spoke to, I've spoken to are kind of cagey about talking about money. And the ones who do talk about it quite candidly always say that. They always say what you've just said. Yeah, exactly. Just sort of never give up your kind of fiscal autonomy, really. I I think it's it's bad for you. It's bad for relationships. It's bad for your decision making. You know, so many women have to make decisions about their personal lives based on their finances, right, which is Mm. worrying. I have not been in a coercive controlling relationship. I want to make it clear. My ex-husband was a nice man. Absolutely. This was not his his Mm. decision. However, we do know lots of women can't leave their relationships because part of the coercive control their partner has over them is financial. And I think things like bank accounts, 
things like credit cards in your name, that kind of stuff can really, really end up dictating what you do from here on in. It can, you know, can end Mm. up dictating whether you stay with a man, whether you leave, what you can do thereafter. And as I say, I cannot stress this was not my situation. My Mm. decisions were my own and they were just kind of naive. They weren't as a result of abuse. But we do know this forms a big part of abuse for lots of women. And so you must retain your autonomy financially. Even if you've only got a couple of hundred quid in a bank account, make sure your name is on the bank account and it stays in the black. Yeah, that's really good advice. I have a money book next, Sally Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I tell you who should write a money book is Lucy Mangan. She's the most financially astute person in the world. And she asks me so many questions about everything else. But if you want to know about money, Lucy Mangan's your person. She's so clever and correct about everything. She's brilliant. I'm always trying to get her to write a money book. But no, it's not like I'm a person who dabbles in stocks and shares. I'm not, mm. you know, a financial expert at all. But I'm responsible because I always feel that if I'm not responsible, everything's going to go tits up, basically. Everything's screwed. So I, I'm I'm careful to make sure there's always, you know, as much as I can control that there's a buffer for everybody. And, you know, and certainly my bills are paid, my taxes are paid and all of that because I couldn't face living in the chaos that I grew up in. It would send me under. Yeah, but it's not expertise, is it? It's noble candour. And I think that's what people like about your beauty columns, about this book, about your beauty books. It's not that you know about stocks and shares and all of that stuff it's not that you can change a tire it's the way of delivering it's like this is just kind of common sense it's like such a I don't know it's not hip but no I think that's a really good point because actually if I'm really really honest as a writer and let's face it a writer that's older than lots of other writers female Mm -hmm. writers that kind of write first person columns and stuff like me I felt there was a thing happening in culture that was really really starting to piss me off which was this kind of hot mess no I don't know how to be an adult Mm -hmm. thing that -hmm. women were expected to be that women had to go oh I've only got a nail varnish and a bottle of vodka in my fridge or whatever oh I don't know my gas supplier is or whatever it is and that became really fashionable for a while and I think lots of women were expected to write like that and certainly there was lots of TV stuff like that where you know oh no I've left my baby on the bus kind of a vibe and I'm not like that and none of my friends are like that and actually I really resent that stereotype because the types of women and in fact the types of people because it's certainly not a female thing the types of people who are like oh I don't know how to be an adult it's not that charming really (laughs) I don't find it that charming I don't find it funny I don't find it entertaining people who are clinging on to their childhood and not wanting to do things properly, do things responsibly, because, oh, that's what adults do. I didn't find that charming. And I I think most people want to get their shit together and most people need some help. And that's what kind of motivated me to write this book because I think most people like their lives in some kind of order which isn't to say I'm some Marie Kondo genius with everything so beautiful and my house is like a temple that's certainly not the case but my life is in order and I think most people do want some kind of order in their lives they don't want to feel like a hot mess they don't want to feel like everything's chaotic I grew up like that and it's actually really not fun remotely it's certainly not sexy or the modern face of womanhood and I felt like culture was kind of saying that to us all the time like oh I'd hate to be a grown-up I just I couldn't relate to it the women I know couldn't relate to it and wherever they were on the continuum to having their shit together they definitely wanted to have their shit together and they didn't identify with this kind of flaky I don't know where my knickers are kind of vibe What struck me about it is that the people who embraced that and thought it was sexy and funny and cool were people who had had never had things spiral out of their control. Yes, and had really privileged backgrounds. And also it's quite a safe thing for men to think or you know it's quite a safe thing for men to think about women isn't it and it's quite an appealing stereotype propagated I think by lots of you know male editors or male commissioning editors on tv and stuff and that women are like that but also you know you can be really scatty if your parents are going to swoop in and pay your bills at the end of it. You can be really scatty mm. if somebody is going to come around and fix your car or if you can get a man in to sort things out. But actually, 
I've never been able to do that until I was an adult and already had things sussed. And actually, most people can't do that. Most people just have to sort out their own bloody lives. And I, I felt like there was lots of stuff happening in culture where you basically had lots of posh people going, oh, isn't it funny? I don't know how to live my life. And it's like, well... You don't have to. You don't have Mm. to have your life together because somebody will always save you. Um, I don't have that. I've never had that. And loads of people don't have that. So I don't see why it's kind of funny or useful. Did you always embrace grown upness? I literally could not bloody wait. I could (laughs) not wait. Did not like being a child. Didn't want to be a child. Would wish away my childhood um, because I just wanted to be an adult. All I ever wanted to be was be an adult. I wanted to work. I wanted to go to work. I wanted to earn my own money. I wanted to do whatever I wanted to do. I wanted to have my own home and I wanted to decide what my life was like. I was obsessed with it. And I do think lots of people have their natural age, don't they? And I, mm. my natural age is definitely in adulthood. I just, I didn't find it fun being a child. I didn't like living at home. I didn't like having people tell me what to do or I just didn't like a feeling that I had, didn't have any autonomy over my life and I just couldn't wait to have it. And I was too impatient because actually I left home when I was a child and I, and, and there were lots of, lots and lots of bad things that came with that because I was a child and there were people who obviously very much took advantage of that. And of course it wasn't the right thing to do. And I'd be devastated if one of my children had done it, absolutely devastated. But nonetheless, at the time, nothing could have persuaded me to not go. Were you 30 when you had your eldest and your dad had, had just died, hadn't he? And you didn't really speak to your mum but how did that not having been parented affect your approach to parenting so I was talking about this this morning I was talking about this exact subject this morning because I was in therapy and um so, so my mother and I had had long periods of estrangement throughout my life so we might not speak for five years then we'd speak for a year then we wouldn't speak for two years you know we were very in and out um, but you rightly say the longest period was after my son was born and that lasted over 13 years the last period of estrangement so basically I had my first son and when he was I think he was t- 10 12 weeks something like that maybe a bit longer, uh, my father died. And so I became a parent and lost a parent almost simultaneously. And I think having children is a really, really big moment for lots of people who've had very difficult relationships with their parents, because you may not have been in a position to show yourself care, but you suddenly are in a situation where you show it to your children. And um, I think perhaps not consciously, decided within the first 18 months of my son being alive that actually I didn't want him involved in the dynamic that we had, that she and I had. And so I withdrew. And so she didn't meet my second child. I had my second child two and a half years later, and she didn't meet him until he was 11, I think. Yeah, at that same time, because work had been so massively important to you as well. Did you stop work when you had your eldest for a bit. Yeah. So when I had my first son, I was absolutely obsessed with the idea that I was going to do things properly, that I was going to be like this amazing mum and be all the things that I had felt my mother hadn't been for me because she was literally not present. And I was going to give up work. I'd been working at the BBC and I was going to give up work altogether. And I was going to do all of the stuff. I was going to, you know, puree the organic vegetables and I was going to breastfeed around the clock. I was going to do, I was going to have the washable nappies, you know, I was going to do all that stuff. And I was so, so, so unhappy, so unhappy, desperately unhappy. I had postnatal depression. My father died. So it was hard to know where one bit of mental ill health ended and the other began. Everything was happening at once. I was so unhappy. And then when I had my second son, I decided because by then what tiny bit of money my father had left me, I had enough to pay for therapy for a year. So I went into therapy and what I had realized by the time I had my second son was that I must not give up work, that this is not something I should do. I was in a very privileged position insofar as I didn't, as a writer, you don't physically have to go into work to make money. And so I decided I was not going to turn down commissions, that I was going to work where possible. 
And I was much, much, much happier, even though there were dreadful moments. There was one moment where I literally was sitting in the cleaning and broom cupboard of Grazia magazine, literally next to a mop <laughs> um, and a mop and hoovers and like cleaning things with a breast pump in one hand and a boot sandwich in the other hand. And I was eating the boot sandwich surrounded by mops and brushes, pumping breast milk because I was at Grazia, shifting at Grazia for the deputy editor who was on holiday. And I was doing that with this baby at home. But I was so much happier because I enjoyed his company so much, my self-esteem wasn't suffering in the way it was when I wasn't working because I had been working since I was a child and I had never accounted for the fact that when I stopped working it would be like a death that everything I thought about myself would come crashing down because all I had ever been was somebody who worked hard and was um, good at what I did and suddenly I was shit at what I did and the thing that I was good at was dead uh, you know it was like it had gone forever and suddenly I was doing something that I didn't know how to do that I'd had no personal experience of myself um, I was bored I was unhappy I was frustrated I was panic stricken I was depressed and actually I really 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 am somebody who needs to work and I've just had to learn that about myself I've written about this before, but there was one time when I had, so I had my eldest in May and then over Christmas, a friend of my ex-husband's got married and her wedding uh, was up north. It was a few days after Christmas. We go to this wedding. So I have this little baby. So he was born in May. So at this point, he's like seven months old Mm -hmm. and he's uh, sitting on my lap at this wedding. And I'm at a round table and there's all couples. There's like four or five couples at this table and I've got the baby on my lap. And a woman at the table said, I watched her turn to the person next to her and say, what do you do? And he said something like, you know, I'm an engineer or something. And she said, what about you? To his wife and his wife said, something like, oh, I'm a teacher. Then went to another woman, oh, I sell insurance. Oh, I work in a college. And she went round the table and she asked my husband and she got to me and she skipped over me and went to the next person because I had a baby on my lap. And uh, because they were all a little bit younger than us and none of them had started having children yet. And she just jumped over me. She didn't say, what do you do? And I couldn't believe it I I couldn't believe it how kind of invisible women with small children become and how they are assumed to be nothing but mothers and they don't have any background they don't have any perspective that isn't about their children they don't have experience that isn't about their children it I couldn't believe it and I thought you fucking wait you wait until yeah. you've had children you'll remember this moment or you won't but something similar will happen to you and you'll feel every bit as awful as I feel now and so I ever since then I've always thought if I see somebody with a small child or a baby I'll always like be like oh what did you do before what you're reading at the moment or did Mm. you watch the news last night or what film have you seen recently because people women with babies just get asked about children all the time yeah it's really interesting because women with babies just get asked about children then you're kind of in the mother zone if you've had children and then like you refer to being invisible as a mother have you found as you've got older as you've crossed into kind of mid late 40s have you started to feel invisible um yes but in a good way I think maybe I'm just not somebody who's ever been remotely interested in being fancied, to be honest. I'm just no. not. I, I always um, I always wanted to be fancied by the person I fancied. It's not that it's not important to me to be desired by the person I desire. I'm not a stone. However, I don't really care if men in the wider world desire me or not. So, so being invisible to heterosexual men is of absolutely no consequence to me and and it sort of made me um feel even more sympathetic for young women and the amount of nonsense that they have to hear from some men I now feel like I'm an observer of it rather than a kind of involuntary participant in it I observe it more and I just think god women have to put up with so much so yeah invisible for me in a good way I also you know I was um looking at a thing the other day I was looking at a beauty launch the other day for some menopausal skincare Mm. 
and I was looking at the, and I was looking at the pictures of these women, and I was just really laughing and thinking, well, those women would have gone through the menopause about fifteen years ago, and like and like you you're, you're casting completely the wrong age of women based on your prejudice, uh, your prejudices mm-hmm. about about middle aged women. I think lots of brands, whether it's beauty or anything else, and the media generally, they forget that people, that women who are menopausal now went to acid house clubs. Exactly. It's like there there are women now who are the other side of the menopause, who were at the hacienda. Like, why are you marketing at them as though they're sort of 90. I just find it really, really strange. And the only way you can explain it is that those women are not making the decisions, right? With the marketing. Totally. Plan. That's the only way you can explain it. Because if any menopausal woman was holding the marketing string, she'd know full well her hair's not like that and none of her friends' hair's like that. And she'd know full well that she still goes on girls' holidays with her mates and gets pissed on cocktails. She, she, she would know that her life is not that life. And so I find that quite intriguing. Annoying, yes, but also intriguing. But I do feel a change has to be coming because there are too many women now who are in their prime who have big jobs. Not enough, but too many. Mm. So they're not too be a tipping point and you know I know loads of women who are kind of menopausal and in a massive massive job and whose kids are still kids you know Mm. their kids their early teens or mid-teens and it's like that cannot be ignored anymore you can't just kind of put people out to pasture because people have their kids later they spend longer being, building their careers so by the time they get to that point where everybody wants to ignore them actually very often you can't because they're they're making big decisions and running big departments or companies and so it feels like a tipping point is coming not fast enough I'm not saying that things are dramatically better but I think they are now unavoidably at a point where things are going to have to change Yeah, it's definitely starting to get better. I think that, like you say, what's really interesting is the way the beauty brands are going, okay, we we can't use anti-aging anymore because we'll get a backlash. But we can actually say menopause now, where we couldn't say menopause five years ago because that would have been like we were targeting old people and we don't want that. And then, you know, and I don't even mind them using menopause to flog a product, but then they go, like you say, they go 20 years back with their imagery. Instead of going, these are the women that look like you and me and everybody we know who are now perimenopausal or menopausal. And that look like lots of different things, right? Because Mm. because what what I also don't want is for brands to think that all menopausal women look like Davina McCall, right? Because, you know... Obviously, they don't. Davina McCall is so gorgeous and so healthy and so health conscious. And God, I'm here for it. What and so an fit, yeah. Yeah, and so fit. I'm here for that. What an inspiration she is to so many people. Like, absolutely, she is a thing for the good. But she is just one face of menopausal women. And most women, whether menopausal or not, will never look like that. And lots of women who are menopausal look much older than that. They're bigger than that. They're smaller than that, whatever it is that it's not one thing, it's not one kind of marketing image. And just as it's not loads of women with, you know, short, permed grey hair, it's also not loads of women who look like Davina McCall or Penny Lancaster or whatever. You're really just talking about an entire gender, so it should just reflect everybody. It should, we should accept that, you know, that they're all really, really different and it's just about making the best of what you have and also it's fine if your menopause is dreadful it's and it's fine if it's great as long as you recognize that not everyone's is the same what's your experience of it are you there yet no although I I take progesterone but I still have regular periods and stuff um but I do take progesterone but what what I would say about that is I have just been in that situation where I take progesterone I've seen firsthand the massive difference between being privileged enough to pay for private mm, health care totally. and not. So I felt really, really, really kind of crestfallen and sad for reasons I couldn't explain. And after a few months of being stonewalled, really, by my GP, I couldn't get anywhere with my GP. I thought, Do you know what, I actually can't handle this anymore. And I paid 
a hormone doctor, which most people wouldn't be able to do, right? Or, or a large mm. number of people in this country wouldn't be able to do. And I think what private healthcare, and that's the only private healthcare I have that, you know, I've got an NHS dentist, an NHS GP, I don't have private healthcare plan or anything. And what that experience of private healthcare has taught me is that private healthcare is certainly not about a better standard of medicine. It's not about better expertise, even it's about time, Mm. you pay for time. And what women don't get in the health service that we have is time and so when they're saying something is very much the matter and I need help with my hormones GPs just don't have time to spend with them and so you end up women just feeling dreadful for a really really long time and I've really I've really appreciated the enormous privilege I've had in dealing with any hormonal issues I've had and I know that when my time does come when things ramp up a bit and I need different things, I know that I can immediately go and access the healthcare I need. And that just makes me more cross for all the women who can't access the healthcare they need. Yeah, I mean, definitely my experience was I had got nowhere with gynecological problems with GP for, you know, it felt like being dismissed, but it probably just was they're too busy to to deal with it properly. And, you know, you go... Being able, the combination of being on red and having a health editor who could say, go and talk to this woman, she's great, and being able to afford it, you know, that puts you in a minority of, I don't know, I'm going to say 1%, I'm making that up, but a very small minority. And most people are just, you know, told to go away by their GP or given, it varies, but the stories I hear over and over again are that women still are not getting the help that they need. They're absolutely not. They're 100% definitely not. And actually hormones, I mean, I know people, everybody feels differently about this, but hormones for me have made a massive difference. Just taking progesterone made a massive, and thyroxine for me. So the issue for me was um, thyroid. And luckily, I'm in a position where when things ramp up, I won't hesitate to access what I need. But I have lots of friends who've taken ages and ages and ages to get to where they need to be. And it's still not there. Before I ask you the questions I always ask at the end, would be very remiss of me not to ask you about going grey. Because when you, I remember when you first mooted going grey, there was a massive backlash, wasn't there? Yeah, quite a few people said, oh my God, don't do it. You'll look so old. And nobody who loves me or anything, but like strangers would say, oh, don't do it. (laughs) Total strangers, yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, don't do it you look so old sorry no don't like it don't like it and I'm quite bad the more people who say that kind of thing to me I then get the arse about it you see and then I think well I'm gonna do it um the more people tell me what to do the more likely I am to rebel and so I had it in my head that I was gonna do it and eventually I did and and I only delayed because I knew I couldn't go back because I'm allergic to hair dye, so I can't dye it back. So I knew that if I made the decision, it was permanent. And so it took me a while to get there. Um, I finally did it. And um, yeah, no regrets. I mean, some days I got kind of idly think, oh, oh, I wish it was brown again, but not in any lasting way. And it was happening anyway. So I just essentially, I think of it as I steered into the skid. It was, you know, it was happening. Mm. And I thought, well, well, I'd rather take control over it and make it happen overnight. Yeah, I was talking to Karen Franklin about this the other day. And she said the exact same thing. I just wanted to make it was going to happen. So I wanted to make it purposeful. You know, I wanted to make it intentional. Yeah. Um, I suppose I wanted to have a handle on it, really. And I I didn't mind the idea of being grey. I just didn't enjoy going grey and the kind of glacial pace things were moving at. And so I just thought I'm just going to do it overnight. I'm going to make the back match the front. And then as it grows out, it will be it will all be grey. And that's what I did. And but actually, no. Nobody in my life, nobody I love was anything but supportive about it. But I think people on the outside uh, thought it was a very bad move indeed. <laughs> but quite a few women have told me since that they've gone grey because of me. And that that's cool. Yeah, no, it looks great. I mean, it's so weird, isn't it? Because I was talking to Jo Elvin yesterday on Instagram about the kind of things that people wrote in to tell you. And when I was on Red, a woman wrote to me who I didn't know specifically to tell me that she didn't like my hair. <laughs> she thought it was too long yeah. and that it was aging. And even if somebody I did know and love said that, I'd probably ignore them. 
Yeah, so would I. The idea that you would bother to write to someone you don't know specifically just to tell them that you think their hair is horrible. It's like, what but it's, are you but like? It's, but it's projection, isn't it? It's always projection. And, you know, what I have learned over the years about people on the internet, myself included, I include literally everyone in this, is that if you have gone out of your way to say something unkind about somebody or to somebody on the internet, you have something going on that has nothing to do with them in that moment. And I absolutely, absolutely believe that. You take something to the external world that you're not processing properly internally. And if if I was compelled to put pen to paper and buy a postage stamp to tell someone their hair was too long, I know it would be time for me to take stock of my life. <laughs> Right. Questions I always ask. What's your emotional age? Uh, 40. Why 40? I just like being middle-aged. I think I was born a bit middle-aged. I've just, yeah. I I feel like everyone in my life is a good thing. Um, I like my marriage. I like my kids. I like my friends. I feel like I'm in order. And I have felt like that since I've been kind of middle-aged, I think. Cool. Give us a book recommendation. So what book would you push on a friend? Okay. There is a book called uh, In Control, which is uh, the steps that coercive controlling relationships follow. Jane Monkton Smith, who is so brilliant, and it's such an important book, and it feels like it's going to be really fibrous and really hard to read, but actually you can zip through it really quickly. It's a really easy book to read, but one that is absolutely expert and actually helpful. And I've I've bought it for several of my friends and they have bought it for their friends. And it's basically useful if you've ever loved a woman or a man, if you've ever loved a person in an abusive relationship, you need to read it. Yeah, it is an amazing book. Good recommendation. What advice would you give younger women? Always keep your own bank account and never, ever, ever spend your time with somebody who makes you believe that you're hard to love. Very good advice. One I think we could all have benefited from taking a lot younger. Um, Who's your old bird role model? Probably my friend Julia. Julia's a really old friend of mine. I've known her since I was 14. She's now 61. I'm 47. I saw her two days ago and um, I still see her all the time and... Uh, yeah, I love her very much. She's a good thing. My children love her. My husband love her. She's just part of my family and an absolute inspiration to me and is very, very, very good at loving people. Brilliant. What's your superpower? My superpower is I can find you literally anything you're looking for to buy. So <laughs> what, whatever you are looking for, whether it's an item of clothing, a home item, a piece of fabric, whatever it is, if you are looking for something to buy and you don't know where to buy it or how to find it, I'll find it for you. Your superpower is basically enabling <laughs> i'll find you a stockist and i'll find you the best prize um and how many fucks do you give uh fewer and fewer but it's a work in progress right before we go do you want to give a bit of a plug for beauty banks okay yes so beauty banks is a charity i co-founded and we are a charity um looking to alleviate hygiene poverty which is the state that many people in this country an increasing number of people in this country are in where they can't afford basic hygiene essentials that lots of people get to take for granted the problem is now so unmanageable that our requests for uh hygiene products such as shower gel toothpaste toothbrushes and so on have quadrupled in the past three months because of the financial financial crisis and recession that we're in. And so if you would like to help us, uh, you can text a donation. I will give you the details for program notes. You can text us a donation. You can go onto our website and make a financial donation, or you can go to one of a hundred super drug stores nationwide and put your products in the bin. However you can help us, we'll be very grateful and everything stays within the charity. And I don't draw a salary. My partner, Joe, doesn't draw a salary. We don't waste anything. So whatever help you can give us will be really really well spent that's brilliant and like sally says i'll put all the details in the show notes if you're not passing a super drug thanks sally so much it's lovely to see you thank you very much lots of love thank you for listening you can hear a new episode of the shift each tuesday wherever you get your podcasts if you like what you hear please do rate review and follow because it really does help other people find us And if you'd like to support The Shift further, please consider becoming a member of our community. Find out more at steady.media forward slash The Shift.